So um, I think this slide's a little bit of foreshadowing because um, the previous great presenters you had have very nice professional slideshows and it's very organized and stuff. So this is sort of giving you fair warning of what's about to happen here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, uh, I'm going to um, jump around a few slides and some of the things I just want to show them to you. I don't really want to get into the details of how it came together because I want to try to get at how we got to where we are with a lot of integrating data, analysis, information, science into growth, smart growth, land management. To me, I use all those terms interchangeably. Uh, this is a far side cartoon. Uh, some of you may have seen it before. It's, it's kind of old, actually. But at the bottom, if you can't see it, this isn't a site test today. It says, <laughs> it's time we face reality, my friends. We're not exactly rocket scientists. So there you go. Um, so I, I, it was really great that um, following up uh, Peter Claggett, um, I, it was always a joy to work with him. Um, um, when I was at the state, I was at state 23 years and then eight, like Helen said, the secretary, um, kind of worked my way up through the department, bothering people more and more as I went further up. But um, a lot of what, what Peter said really relates to, to what I'm going to try to show you a little bit. Not that I'm going to say the same thing, but the issues are, are very intertwined. One thing Peter said at the beginning of his presentation um, was <laughs> now in 2018. Where are you, Peter? You ran away. Oh, back there. Um, that we're finally um, actually counting the effects of smart growth, land, land, land use practices, planning um, into the Bay program. And so for someone that got involved in Maryland's Bay program directly as in local government before I came to the state, I came to the state in 1992, um, it truly was a flat earth kind of thing. I mean, I'm this planner. Most of the people in the Bay Program back then, some I you know, still know, still hang out with, still like them. You know, they're focused on the here and now for them. And Peter alluded to this. And it was pipes, ag BMPs, stormwater a little bit back then. Um, and my God, this planning stuff, why are you in this room? And God forbid I mention septic systems. I mean, they, you know, I mean, and so... Um, and, and that's one of the reasons I, I came to the state. So it's a little bit of a flat earth versus round earth thing. Um, I don't know if I, I use this slide a lot, um, and I think all you all are familiar with Maryland, but it really uh, is important, some important context. Um, just remind you all some of it. Maryland's the fifth most densely populated state in the nation. I say this stuff in my sleep still. Um, I still live in Maryland. I was born and raised in the swamps of Wicomico County. Um, I'm, I'm up in Delaware now, and having a good time up there, but uh, I still live in Maryland. Um, so that's important. It's also um, the 18th largest in population, so it's a relatively small state geographically, but it's more, it's more populated than average. If you realize we have 50 states and we have the 15th most populated, it's still growing. It's the richest state in the nation. Um, another hugely important point, um, and I really live this every day in Delaware, is 95% of um, Maryland's land area drains the Chesapeake Bay. That's one of the reasons it's such a huge driver can be a huge driver and has been for doing a lot of things in the environment in general and certainly for smart growth. Um, that, that lack of, um, of, of cohesiveness for something like the Bay that Marylanders hold so true to their hearts, um, we really feel that in Delaware. Like there's just not that link between water quality and something like the Bay realizing they have the Delaware Bay like there is in Maryland. That's, that's a big deal. So the other couple things, Maryland is of high expectation for quality of life. It's a strong county state. Um, and um, important, important point here, I really want to highlight this is the first state to have a statewide geo database uh, with parcel, parcel geo database, parcel data. Um, that really mattered a lot back then. Um, this is the early to mid 90s. Um, uh, to be able to really refine the land use mapping because sprawl was out of sight, out of mind. Um, so I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, state has a lot of good, strong GIS coordination. Uh, it happened in sort of several different phases over the years, bottom up, top down a little bit. Um, and then one of the things I love to say about Maryland is American miniature. So what I want to talk about is some mapping and how they progressed over time. Um, not all development's the same. Some development pollutes more than others. Uh, and um, try to answer the question what septic systems are hiding and effects on the Bay and growth policy. And true to form in this presentation, th this is not going to go in some nice, neat order like my very good and professional um, folks that spoke before me. 
I think you all know this, why we do smart growth, a whole bunch of reasons, environmental protection, fiscal, being fiscally responsible, preserving rural lands for um, resource protection and production, saving the bay, sustainability, having better, more vibrant communities. Um, this is my first um, growth model. It's sort of like caveman trying to big the we dig, build a wheel. Um, but, you know, the more I got involved back when I had more brain cells and trying to help build the growth model back in the 90s with a lot of other smart people, um, we'll come back to this sometime. So this is very complicated. It's 100 little cells. I just used it's probably Lotus 123 when I first did this. I don't think Excel is even around. Um, not quite an abacus, but it's close. And it's really saying if you're going to, you got a, in those 100 acres, 100 little cells, each represents an acre. And then if you're going to develop 100 units, well, if you built quarter acre lots, it used to be a fairly common residential um, uh, lot size. You know, keep in mind a lot is roughly the size of a football field. An acre is roughly the size of a football field. Um, you could crank it all down, not crank it down. Quarter acre lots are not that tight, but you could uh, accommodate it on 25 acres and the rest would be green on that top, top uh, um, rectangle there. Um, if everyone has to have a whole acre so they can mow a lot of grass, then you're going to consume the whole 100 acres. So that's the, the most sophisticated growth model you're ever going to see. <laughs> um, so now I'm showing Bernie Fowler here for a whole bunch of reasons. He's the reason I came to the state of Maryland. So in 1992, there was a, um, something called the Patuxent Demonstration Project. Some people still are, are, are very upset that that ever happened because it brought me to state government for 23 years. <laughs> But um, what that was a, a lot of what that was about is Batuxent has always been the, the proving ground, the guinea pig, uh, the laboratory for the Chesapeake Bay program, and, and really for water resource um, uh, work nationally. It's the largest river totally within the state, so it's got all the features. It's got trout streams, free-flowing streams in its headwaters. It's got reservoirs in its up, up and upper reaches. It's got tidal freshwater. Um, and it's got Fort Meade in the middle, <laughs> including the NSA, um, and uh, it also has a significant estuarine uh, portion to it. Um, it's got older, it's got all different types of development types. It's got sprawl in it, it's got um, forest, significant forest, significant agriculture, it's got sprawl, little towns, big towns, everything in between. Um, the other thing about the Patuxent is Western Branch in Prince George's County is where the first um, ENR, um, and, and uh, excuse me, BNR, biological nutrient removal, wastewater train, major wastewater treatment plant was built, and that's I'm not going to go through this whole thing because I'm going to um, I'm going to really impress Bill Dennison over here. But um, the whole uh, effort of going after nitrogen back then and realizing how important that was uh, to an estuary, uh, removing nitrogen from the wastewater treatment plant. It's a whole long, very interesting story on that. Um, but what, what that meant was, um, and that related to, there's this Patuxent Charette, which is like a big dispute resolution effort following a lawsuit. The southern Maryland counties were, su were suing the upper counties, there's seven counties in Patuxent. Montgomery and Prince George, the two biggest in the state at the top, going all down through the middle of southern Maryland. So there's a lawsuit between the southern Maryland counties and the upper counties and EPA. They settled it and they came up with um, the 40% reduction goal, which really in many, many ways is the same goal we're using now. Um, so with all this going on, realizing sort of a, one, one of the silver bullets, quite frankly, in saving the bay was enhanced wastewater treatment plants. Um, and that was demonstrated at Western Branch and really showed demonstrated results, um, not that fluffy, smart growth stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and then um, what, what the, the gist of the um, demonstration project was, was um, Senator Mikulski worked with EPA to get that money. They um, wanted to say, okay, so we kind of know what we need to do here. We still have a ton of work to do. We know what tact, what direction we're going to take away from our treatment plants in Maryland. Um, what about this other stuff? You know, it's a growing area, and we don't measure that. We don't know where growth is going. So um, there was this project um, involved the, basically the, 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 um, the Bay Cabinet type uh, state agencies uh, and then the seven local governments. Uh, and um, we, in that, we came up with some plans and strategies of local governments, and we built the growth model. And I could talk a lot more about this. And plus, I'm a big fan of Bernie Fowler. So I built the growth model. Um, and I'm um, sorry it's kind of shoved to the side and kind of small right there. I didn't mean for that to be uh, symbolic necessarily. And I certainly don't mean to, to be partisan or anything, but um, 
career level staff that ran that growth model, almost all of them were fired. And really, the department cannot run this model right now. They can use bits and pieces of it. But this model that was built in house over 20 or more, over 20 <laughs> years cannot be run right now by the Maryland Department of Planning. Um, the, some of the other things that came out during these years was enhancing, um, I mentioned the parcel database that was, was um, developed and um, used for a multitude of purposes. Um, and I'll get to the, the uh, land use mapping in just a minute. But a lot of applications were developed over time. So uh, sister agencies, citizens, stakeholders could use it, um, really advancing um, what the state was doing as well as a lot of other people and a lot of applications online, different ways to use it, different apps um, a lot of times uh, to help implement technical assistance. If laws, laws are passed or new policies, a lot of times an app would be written to help local governments and others to, to do the work. Um, also working across sister agencies, um, building up to Maryland IMAP, so an organized way to share mapping resources um, uh, across the state, whether in state government, local government, uh, uh, what have you. Um, one of the things we use a lot of this data for was um, to help better target land preservation efforts. So Maryland uh, was one of the national leaders in, in preserving land. It's really important because of the characteristics that I mentioned, being uh, expecting a high quality life, protecting the environment, and um, the need for a compact growing state. I've got the bay. And um, one of the things, uh, going back to the parcel data, is that a lot of times you would see folks producing land use maps for their jurisdictions or for their regions or the areas of interest. And they might, if, if it wasn't part of a town or wasn't necessarily zoned for dense development, it was all green on their maps and be called rural or ag preservation or something. Um, and um, and aerial photography, if you're, depending on what scale you're using it, might not show that low density sprawl stuff, the two, three, four, five acre stuff that can really chew up uh, your landscape. So when we started to integrate parcel data into that, um, it started to upset people because a lot of places that were painted rural on these big maps on people's wall really weren't. They were really pockmarked with those little red dots um, and really had sort of fragmented the landscape, which makes it not that valuable for resource production or resource protection in many ways. And so this was some grid analysis um, that was done um, in, in ARC Info uh, and uh, other things we used to sort of highlight areas that should be targeted where the contiguous tracts of undeveloped land also factored in areas on growth pressure and how well protected they were. Um, used um, for the Bay TML, demographic analysis. So this, a lot of this led up to um, you guys have never seen these maps before, led up to how we plan for Smart Growth 2.0. So I'm going to do this very fast. The reds developed, the green is forest, and the light green is ag land, Baltimore, D.C. So I'm going to do this really fast, because many of you have seen this before, a little sort of stepping out over time, um, and projecting to 2035 there, and just showing those growth patterns. Charles County stuck in there. Um, and what that did is it showed you two scenarios, a smart growth, a realistic smart growth scenario, looking at plans and zoning and infill rates, um, stuff that uh, we talked with Peter about over the years, trying to emulate a little bit, and he's really done great work with that. This is sort of a smart growth type pattern. This is more what was on the books, uh, sort of taking existing zoning without improving it and projecting it forward. And this, those boxes are, are scaled to new acres of development, new, new developed land. Um, so I've never made the cover of the Rolling Stone, like the song uh, is, but we did make the cover um, of Planning Magazine, which for planning nerds, great thing. And just talking about moving forward um, with smart growth, um, building on the maps, literally um, layering them, you know, where we want to target growth, green print, green print ag print, where we want to target um, based on analysis, ag preservation, Growth print, sorry, that was green print up there. That's targeting for uh, resource protection. This is targeting for ag preservation. This is targeting for smart growth. And then rolling that together was Plan Maryland, which has been um, taken away, deleted, essentially. Um, but it really is trying to roll together a lot of the policies and move them forward. Um, I'm going to finish up here in just a second. So then you have um, how uh, not only the preservation side, but trying to target 
redevelopment, trying to use some of the um, analysis tools and displays for infill and redevelopment in, in downtown Salisbury. I think Andrew worked on this a little bit back in the day. And um, so in a nutshell, um, there's this big parking lot, my hometown. Actually, I, have a, I was hatched over here from the hospital over here long ago um, in downtown Salisbury. This is a parking lot right next to the river with, uh, you can pull the hook? No, no, no. Oh, all right, got scared to death. <laughs> I'm I know, I'm close. I got my watch right here, yeah, I'm close. Um, so it's surface far. parking. Uh, North Prong, Wacomica River over here, and um, downtown plaza, not a whole lot going on. Um, we work with the city um, and trying to show some, some new GIS tools we're using. This is dated. This software is a lot more advanced now, um, but we were some of the first in the state to use it. And just saying, hey, what if you actually build something doable that zoning would actually allow on this parking lot that's rarely used? Um, and what we figured out is, you know, we did this, again, this is all scaled to the zoning. This isn't playing with Lego blocks or anything. This is real stuff. Um, and we realized that this square footage here, you add it up, would be the same square footage as the Icky Salisbury Mall, this north of town and sea of parking, very 1980s type uh, mall. And um, the mayor liked it. And um, so they worked on an RFP or off cue to sort of see if there was interest to build something like this. And there, some aspect of that's been moving forward. There's that mall I was referring to, a very standard issue suburban mall. And then this is the footprint of what that, the, that parking lot would be on top of the mall. Same, <laughs> same square footage. All right, so I got to finish real quick with a little bit of this. So poop and planning. Um, so the septic bill from 2012, um, you know, I'm not going to get into all this stuff. Basically, um, what we, and using a lot of analysis, um, um, with our friends at the state, uh, folks at MDE and others, um, figured out that your average household on septic um, polluted 10 times more your average household in sewer in Maryland um, and uses approximately seven times more land per household. So came up with this tier mapping system. I think you're all familiar with it. One of the things relevant to today is that legislation had a lot of things in it very tied to things you could analyze, not just be someone's opinion of what should be in one category or the other. This is important because this is in a tier four, the most protected, most controversial part of that legislation from 2012. And um, so this language is in there not by accident so that it could be um, mapped objectively, empirically, and not have to be some kind of derived thing. And that really helped um, hold the line when a county like my friends in Cecil County said this should be their map with that limited amount of tier four, which were already parks and sort of out of play for development versus what it should have been. Um, not that that convinced Didn't them. Did they call you a Nazi? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did. But you don't, you know, if you've not been called a Nazi or a communist in your career, you haven't done anything. I know, I agree, I agree. So. I haven't called. Yeah, <laughs> I'm about to finish, I promise. So one of the things I'm going to show, this is good old Charles County, um, one of my favorite, of course, good old Chuck County, and we're using it to show areas when the county was being mapped for the, the tiers, areas that were kind of, we thought should be in tier four, and they were in this other tier, tier three, where you can build more septics. And we were using mapping analysis to show, well, this does meet the criteria. You can see it's forested. And then we actually use um, the parcel data to show, look, you can see what's built and what isn't. See those, those black dots? And this is the area of interest. And then we actually took, used Google Street View just to sort of show you on the ground what does it look like. So this should be tier four. Again, tier four is for protecting areas that are rural, um, putting it simply. So click at some, some conclusions. I'm not going to read um, all of them, but um, you know, you will have to invest in the technology um, to do this. Uh, people have to understand it. That's why I joked around that's really simplistic graph I showed you earlier and sort of taking it from there. Um, you need support from leadership um, and, and also make sure the right staff to do this and train them up. Um, understand your stakeholders. Um, you got to direct the public um, directly. Um, because I'm in this big science setting here today, all these smart scientific people, I use meters, uh, the metric system, and, you know, <laughs> all that, and, you know, instead of you know working at 30,000 feet and such. Um, so you got it's got to be scalable. There, I set mid bullet. Um, local knowledge and inputs are critically important. Um, and uh, one of the things I mentioned 3D, visualizing the data better. I mean, two-dimensional maps 
I look at them, I understand them, I sort of can get what the landscape may look like, but really it gets a lot of attention. That 3D map I showed you, we did a fly through with it. I don't want to mess with that in here, but that got put in a local TV station, um, the news, that was really cool. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things with the history, um, with the Bay Program, you know, I really had to fight for getting these issues in, uh, included back then. Because again, people were very busy, still are, with the more traditional uh, methods by which to protect the Bay and trying to continue to force in this, again, tougher, more controversial, um, more ferial, longer term issue is very, very hard. And I'm very excited to see what, what Peter um, um, was doing today. And again, not to end on a negative, but th this is important, and I don't want to make people uncomfortable, but the Hogan administration has dismantled um, many of the Maryland Department's abil uh, planning's ability to do this work. Um, I think it's pretty clear they don't support this kind of work. And the, the, what's relevant to that is, you know, if you don't agree with the policy, you can go after the policy for sure, and, and they've done that, but you can also go after the analysis that supports that policy. So I think that's very relevant, that, that relationship between data analysis and science and policy. So a lot of things I'd love to talk about, but I'd better leave it later before I really get the hook from my buddy Helen. So thank you. Well, I see.